a very good evening to all of you so uh, i'm uh, here to speak to you today about the the current scenario and uh, my topic is on world war c reimagining healthcare through the pandemic lens um uh, i would like to first introduce my organization i am representing healthcare global we are a chain of cancer centers we are also into infertility in a very small way and we have our own vertical uh, strand life sciences which deals with precision medicine and we have our general specialty hospitals we are currently at about 26 centers across the world which uh, includes vietnam and africa where we entered recently we went ipo in 2016 uh, we have a very robust academic system in association for research and academics where we run our courses with the Royal College of Surgeons with major master class in research and publication. Uh, to introduce this topic to you, you know, I was remembering and recollecting the word of uh, Sir Winston Churchill, where he spoke about the World War II and the role of Russia. He said it's a little wrapped in a mystery with an enigma, but perhaps there is a key. Today, these words seem to sound so emphatic. These words seem to sound so so profound and uh, today that is precisely the situation we are in right with the uh, corona pandemic today nobody is an expert not a intensivist not a uh, cell biologist not an immunologist not a pulmonologist not an intensivist not a physician so that is where we are in currently today with regarding to this riddle so i thought i'll put together my perspectives for the World War C, you can call this the World War COVID, or you can call it World War emerging from the region where it where it came out from. Now today, if you look at this graph, this virus seems to have been affecting close to 16 million lives and about close to 6 lakh deaths. What's really staggering about this is that this virus which weighs about 0.85 atograms that's about 10 10 is to minus 18 grams 10 is to mi minus 18 power grams if you put this entire virus of the entire globe put together from all its infective material it must be weighing about 9 grams just imagine that these 9 grams have actually put together the entire world to a comfortable standstill and that kind of makes us rethink, is this really not a nuclear war? That these 9 grams have actually brought the entire thing to a standstill. So today here we are in this World War C. And let's look at what is it that is in store for us. Now if you look at the new age war that we are facing today, this World War C is going to be fought not by soldiers but by doctors. This is the world war that is not going to be fought by weapons, but it's going to be fought using soaps and sanitizers. This is a war that is not going to be fought with close counters, but in social distancing. And interestingly, this pandemic has got not only loss of sense of smell, but also loss of common sense. That is where this pandemic is kind of emerging in this new world war. And as we are evolving, what we have seen closely today is that there have been two bad options that governments across the world have had. Either you sacrifice health or you sacrifice economy and nobody seems wiser than the other. Even the most developed countries have posed the worst examples today wherein health has been put as a back burner compared to economy. So if you ask me today, I, I don't think there's a perfect right decision. But yes, there is a smart decision that people will have to take, which is to balance both of these. Now, that is where the entire ecosystem has to be rebooted into. And that is something that we're going to be talking about. Now, the key principles of countries that have won this particular thing meticulously, that means if you have seen people who have, who have outperformed their uh, capabilities, have been countries like Germany, South Korea, countries such as uh, New Zealand, Australia, that have been working hard to keep the, the box it in principle, have used five key principles. Trace, test, treat, teamwork, and training. Now, my friends, I am here to re-emphasize. Today, you know, there has been no right decision. But yet, people who actually won this to a great extent have been people 
who somewhere had a very proper natural management, a natural disaster management drill. And why I'm emphasizing this is I give a simple example. Imagine if somebody today comes to attack me in, and is right in front of me. If I know karate, I can defend myself. But if I do not know karate, I cannot tell him, please wait for a minute and I'm going to. I, I cannot. Uh, sorry. I cannot, sorry, there was some, some, I cannot at that juncture tell him that I'm going to look at a YouTube video and then do some karate moves. And this is the key important determinant that we need to understand that many, many countries that failed today did not have a disaster management drill. Real priorities were shifted. Now, this is what is crucial to understand that there, this particular operation of the COVID-19 is like a military operation. You have to have a natural disaster management drill if you want to win this war. And the key aspects to this, one of the vital ones were number four and five, that is teamwork and training. So unless you are geared up for a pandemic like this, you will not be able to achieve and give results. So that brings us to some of the questions of where we are today in this World War C, we are going to see the psychological impact, the economic impact and the behavioral impact. Psychologically, we are going to have social negativity, loneliness, depression, a lot of negativities that are going to compound the whole scenario with a fractured economy, with drastic cuts in production volumes, service spectra, pay cuts, job cuts and finally pocket cuts. So we are anticipating that crimes are going to increase if, if the trends worsen the same way and behaviorally you are going to see that you will need to re-establish human connect in the midst of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter connects and release the life that abounds our vicinity, not only on the social media. So these are three profound impacts that are going to be faced in front of us. Now the question is, how are we going to stay productive at these times? What are we going to do to rise above these odds? And how do we minimize the loss of human life and failing health and yet mitigate the economic loss? Now, these are some of the broad questions that lie before us as we deal with this evolving pandemic. So what this requires really is a pandemic CEO. It requires a pandemic CEO who looks at a strategy and a stratagem that is devised and evolves out of a leadership position. And I'm saying this because this needs a lot of emphasis. This entire game of health today has taught us that this is all about leadership going to be. Now, whenever we talk about a stratagem, you know, a stratagem is an, is an approach superior to a strategy. Sometimes you need to adopt a stratagem because it's like you have to win a war without fighting it. You cannot win the Corona war with the virus in front of you because right now the virus has completely hit you by the blind side with no treatments, no vaccines, except for the only simple social measures because this virus is a social virus. So how are we going to readopt strategies and that requires the leadership of a pandemic CEO, a leadership that is driven from behind. I always call this as the pandemic protocol, which means in a pandemic protocol, the leadership should be from, divine, uh, from behind. The reason for that, I'm, I was sharing with our uh, Honorable Health Minister of Karnataka and I was exchanging my thoughts and saying that in this current scenario, nobody is an expert. It is only through collective wisdom that we will be able to achieve this goal by leadership from behind, like a wolf pack theory, wherein the person leads from behind. So I may not be an expert, but I know as a leader, not only when to lead, but also when to follow. How can I actually follow the scientific advices given by this? Uh, what if Fossey in USA as the head of helms of CDC would be driving the entire philosophies rather than the president himself? What if the science would be driven today rather than politics? And that is what is required today that the pandemics will demand for a new age politics that will have leadership from behind, not from front. And I've just put forward five important components that conglomerate the smart theory, which I want to, uh, which I want to elaborate on. Um, the first, which I have elaborated time and again to our government to say that this is a war that cannot be won in the hospital. This is a war to be won at home. So when we actually went in for the first lockdown, the first 21 day lockdown, we actually divided our strategy into three important aspects. 
the first is phase of preparation the second phase after that of um, of uh, a military approach where we divide where we build a china wall between the positive corona patients and the negative corona patients and the last phase wherein we shift focus to the hospitals so we where we reemphasize that let's not invest on ventilators because this war cannot be won on a ventilator you are going to lose this war on a ventilator the second which needs to be thought of thoroughly is how do i remain productive at the time of corona and the one single thing that this c has taught us is another c, that is collaboration and not another c which is competition so it has taught us the one single mantra that this is the only way to survive which is going to be through collaborative efforts and so productivity will happen through collaboration and not competition the third thing like i said in this pandemic what we have understood is that one single thing that stands out is there is a loss of sense of smell that happens during this pandemic but also there is a sense of loss of common sense that is happening which is what is happening through media through whatsapp forward through various uh, platforms wherein our loss of common sense seems to be more pandemic as a social pandemic compared to the loss of sense of smell and that is what the corona virus has done to us it has driven us up the wall in terms of all uncommon directions it's also something that we will need to rethink about reverse mentorship and i'm going to talk about this a little more in detail but just one single thing to emphasize to you that nobody is an expert today neither a virologist neither an immunologist neither an intensivist in the icu neither a physician nobody has been an, uh, an expert completely today it is all teaching us how to collaborate in order to relearn strategies and lastly it's also teaching us to look beyond the gdp and only to look at conscious capitalism and i'm going to touch upon each one of these topics a little uh, briefly in each one of these so based on this i had written this op ed on the leadership protocols at the covid time which actually is about giving a health perspective to the whole story and i'm i'll be happy to share it with the zenov team so that they can uh, share it with anybody interested to read more on this so putting this together we actually formed a, a core team a covid consultative group uh, uh, with uh, justice mn venkatachalaya the former chief justice of india as the chief mentor and the chair for this where we actually wanted to guide philosophies we knew that there were things that governments were doing to the best of their abilities but it was not still good enough so we actually put up a team of experts which actually included from creative artists to our ministers mps to also people from uncommon backgrounds um, uh, whether it was finance or whether it was this, because this was a collective goal that we wanted to reach through the uh, through the uh, through the covid consultative group so like i told you earlier we divided the entire thing into 3 weeks the 21 day lockdown when which was announced was divided into three important weeks the week one wherein we said we are going to keep the hospitals ready uh, we are going to prepare prepare for ppes prepare for manufacturing prepare for other things and the week two was to build the china wall and the week three was to open the hospitals even today most formulas that that have been done across the world revolve around these three simple things that this is the only thing that we can do currently to beat the virus so uh, what interestingly i wanted to share was march 12th i was supposed to be in london uh, for a meeting that was hosted by mr michael bloomberg who was the who who is the who global ambassador dr tedros the who director general and sadi khan the mayor of london we were all supposed to be set for the meeting around march 5th i still got a correspondence from their office confirming that our meeting was on and i was one of the speakers unfortunately just a few days later we just got to hear that the health minister was affected and eventually after that the prime minister the first single indication that we got that this is not going to spare even the most elite of the people and what we also learned at that time when we started collectively doing was what can we do to avoid this global pandemic so i think around march 15th i started the real work on understanding what can i do in my limited role to make a difference to the ongoing pandemic and uh, uh, i must tell you all i redirected during that lockdown my resources and my energies towards research towards publications towards training towards certifications towards online consultations social engagements with governments and assisting them providing them service and employer engagement programs because we needed to reconsolidate and restrategize our efforts so over the last 3 um, 4 uh, months we've actually put up seven new targeted work from hcg on 
convalescent plasma therapy we've set up a uh, plasma bank at for karnataka we're working on a cytokine cocktail study a cytokine therapy which is actually looking at reactivating the immune system and this particular theory of ours is uh, we've completed the phase 1 trials successfully and animal studies and now we are entering into the phase 2 trials with cytokine therapy which actually looks at reactivating your immune system for the covid virus it's a treatment it's not a vaccine the third which is mesenchymal stem cells which we looked at for actually improving the uh, patients who are terminally ill patients who are on a ventilator to reverse their lungs we set up the plasma bank we actually worked on ai algorithms for chest x ray screening because we found that chest x ray is a very effective tool we've completed more than 2000 patients as of now where in just within 5 minutes using ai algorithms of uh, deep convoluted neural networks uh, our uh, tech team along with the help of drdo is helping us detect these particular x rays to 88% to 96% accuracy we have built three non invasive tests using the itbt ministry's support to actually do simple non invasive tests for the hospital we have now worked on repurposing through computational biology and bioinformatics new drugs that we believe with the support of elsevier's which is going to help us combat repurposed herbs for covid infection and we are starting the trial soon so look at what all we've been able to achieve through this we've actually had elsevier's as our academic and research partner the lancet research center and others they've been extremely forthcoming i want to acknowledge hema and ujwal here we created the virtual trial clinical trials platform because in the current pandemic scenario we were not able to conduct a standard trial so we went in to actually set up a virtual clinical trial and we went on to publish more than 17 international publications and research now this is some of the list of those now this is what i meant to say that re strategizing productivity we went into a digital learning and i think this is a core important thing that we relearned this was an article that uh, was published in one of uh, the newsletters by kiwings digital learning was something i had envisioned envisioned a few months ago and today it was put to practice so from using virtual reality to augmented reality to extended reality we actually used every single aspect of online learning to expand the scope of our work so we actually had earlier a thing called cmd continued medical education we expanded that into comment continued online medical education and we've currently had at least 40 such teaching sessions um, interactive sessions um, webinars and such platform using digital learning so it was a time for us to re-strategize re-innovate and look at what can we do to expand the scope of work that we were doing you know interestingly we also started a program called the surgeon scientist program you know you will be amazed to hear that when we talk about bench to bedside medicine it takes on an average about 17 years to do bench to bedside which means you start from basic science research then you go for human research and clinical research then it gets into guidelines and then into practice now on an average this can take as high as 17 years isn't that shocking to see that it takes 17 years for you to bring a molecule to the market as high as that now what i found interesting during the covid time was this was reduced to 17 days i must tell you in these 17 days what i saw for example when we started the cytokine therapy we actually had to operationalize our work at a complete lockdown when there was nothing to we opening up the animal labs to conducting the animal experiments and giving the animal experiments results in a week then presenting that data to the uh, to the drug controller general and then after that processing this has been like a formula one track uh, you know pit stop for us so um, the new age innovations uh, i think uh, the the key messages that i want to give and i'll be closing this uh, with these remarks is that the new age innovations are going to be a hallmark that are going to be represented by conscious capitalism by wealth creation with value creation and ambition with purpose i think this is the key important driving things that are going to define and recreate uh, the new generations i feel for uh, corporate worlds for um, for any new uh, uh, emerging uh, areas in the future for trade and another very interesting thing that i learned was on the aspects of reverse mentoring you know today one thing that we learned is most of them went wrong who went wrong state governments went wrong union governments went wrong physicians went wrong doctors went wrong individuals went wrong 
what is it that we need to re-strategize? And one of the things that we've been, we've started this program called reverse mentoring, where we are talking about what can developed countries learn from developing countries? What can the rich learn from the poor? What can corporations learn from simple startups? What can actually the, what can actually the, the older generation or what we call the mature generation learn from the agile generation, the younger generation. And this is the, the real crux that we will need to bring out through these, uh, uh, through these new age eras. You know, we, we built up an RGUHS, Rajiv Gandhi University Innovation Challenge. We, were, we actually flouted this entire thing in five days and the prime minister came to inaugurate this session. What was most interesting was from the first year students, we had about 1,200 applications of young Turks coming to us and telling us we wanted to do something uh, radical. And, and I was telling my vice chancellor that, look, 700 institutions, if we were able to trust these youngsters, maybe they'll give us better solution than what we have been providing today. So we've actually rethought about a concept called Create in India, because today with Make in India, we have been somewhere importing every component from other countries and building it in India and saying make in India. But I think it's time for us to re-strategize. And I started this with our own uh, thing because I did a voice device for my throat cancer patients. And I started asking my team, if uh, where do we get the silicon from? And if it's China, why are we getting it from China? If we don't have a molding machine, why are we not manufacturing it in India? And why are we, why are we trying to import it from China? So, I think the new campaigns for the new age would be requiring is create in India along with make in India. And lastly, I think, um, you know, we're somewhere I was always feeling that it looked like humanity was behaving like the virus and Corona was the vaccine. So, you know, midst of communalism, capitalism, corruptionism, humanism needed to come victorious. And that is something that as a clarion call, we need to uh, to bring out during this particular learning lesson for us that let us not show that humanity was the virus and uh, let us look at what best we can re-strategize through these entire efforts. And I'm going to close this with these beautiful words from Dalai Lama. You know, I had met, I had the fortune of meeting him some time back and uh, these are some of the very profound words from his side that when asked what surprised him most about humanity, he said man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money then he sacrifices his money in order to recuperate his health. He then is so anxious about the future that he doesn't enjoy the present. The result being he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and then he dies as if he's never lived. This particular profound words cannot be more true for than in the times of Corona. So with this, I think I'm going to close the session. Thank you very much.